Do you take pills? Oh, I don't or... think I've ever taken a pill before. <clears throat> okay. Right, I have it. Um, but... The girl with the strange vocabulary nervously puts on a little hat, a reminder of one of her sisters right. who's depending on her. Our parents are abusing. They abuse us. But the reason I called and the reason I managed to get out here, this is one of the most scary things I've ever done. Uh -huh. I'm terrified. But... I called because my two little sisters, they're chained up right now. Do you have pictures of that? Yes, I can show you. I actually didn't have it, and then one of my sisters told me I need to get pictures. You have pictures of your sisters chained up? Yes, but uh, they're, yeah, they're in here. Okay. I, I don't have proof of everything, but I have proof that my sisters are chained up. So see? She doesn't seem to know the word bruised. Yeah, you can look at that. See, those are the places that make it known that. And see how dirty she is? We are so filthy. We, we, we don't take baths. We don't. How did your sisters get like this? Okay. Your parents yeah, chained them up? Yes, because they stole food. Okay. But they stole it because they were hungry. Who took this picture? I did. The woman who murdered beloved singer Selena Quintanilla Perez has faced her share of hostility in prison. In 2016, as Yolanda Saldivar was moved to the prison corridors, at least two women lunged at her and had to be restrained by other guards, a former inmate tells the messenger. She is despised, says the former inmate. Everyone wants to get her. She's the most hated person at Mountain View. Salivar seeks parole in 2025 due to feeling unsafe. There's a bounty on her head, a relative tells the messenger of her circumstances behind bars. She says she doesn't feel safe in prison which is why she wants to get out. Saldivar shot the beloved Tejano singer Selena over financial disputes and claimed it was an accident. But in 1995, she was convicted of the murder and sentenced to life in prison. The messenger spoke to a former guard at Mountain View, who confirmed that there have been frightening incidents over the years, but says Saldivar has never been in grave danger. We kept the other inmates away from her, the former guard says. But there were credible threats sometimes. But our job is to keep her safe, no matter how many people hate her. The messenger has also learned that Saldivar plans to cite her safety fears as one of the justifications for release when she's up for parole in 18 months. Former inmate Yesenia Dominguez commented, She can cry all she wants about feeling like she's in danger, but at least she's alive to complain about it. And Selena is still dead. Half of my body was amputated after being crushed by a forklift. My name is Lauren Showers. At that time, he was only 19 years old and was working 10 meters up when I ended up falling to the ground. It was at that moment that a forklift ran over me, crushing the lower half of my body. The shock was immediate and the pain unbearable. Everything happened very fast. I was soon rushed to the hospital. The doctors presented me with two options, both of which I found difficult to accept. The first was to try to rebuild half of my body from the waist down but the chances of survival were slim. The second alternative was to cut off that half of my body, which would increase my chances of survival. Even in that moment of despair, I told the doctors that I would rather survive if only my head was left. So the doctors took the drastic decision and removed half of my body. Also, due to the accident, I lost part of one of my arms. Now I depend on the bags for my needs since the evacuation channels have been eliminated. Despite all the adversity, I did not give up. I wanted to live and find happiness somehow. I often say that, despite everything, the most important thing is that I am alive. The rest is a matter of adaptation. I underwent numerous physical therapy sessions to gain as much independence as possible. Learning to get into the wheelchair on my own was a challenge, but I was willing to overcome it. Life moved on and I found love. I'm now engaged and have plans to marry my girlfriend. Many times people ask us what our marriage will be like, and we always answer that the love we feel for each other is what really matters. Circumstances may have changed drastically for me, but the feeling is genuine and deep. So that's my story. A journey of improvement, adaptation, and discovery of what really matters in life. And you, what do you think of this story? Feel free to comment and like, thanks for the support. Have you ever heard of Sarah and Jacob Hoggle? Sarah and Jacob were three and two on September 7th of 2014. On that morning, their older brother had a soccer game that Troy and Catherine, their mother and father, took them to. 
After the game, Troy and Catherine took Sarah and Jacob to the park to play for a little bit. Troy had to be at work around 2.30 and he left both Jacob and Sarah with their mother, Catherine, while he went to work. Catherine had been diagnosed with some mental health issues, but she seemed to be working through them. Troy kissed the kids goodbye and went to work and everything seemed normal. But around four o'clock that afternoon, Catherine told her mother, who they were with at the time, that she was gonna take Jacob out to get some pizza. But when she returned, Jacob wasn't with her. She said that she had left him at a friend's house for a sleepover. Catherine then took their older son and Sarah home for the evening. Troy got home around midnight and he would usually go kiss the kids goodnight before he went to bed, but this night he was too tired and decided to just go to bed. But when he woke up, Catherine and Sarah were gone. When he questioned Catherine about where the kids were, she said that she had taken them to a new daycare facility and that they were fine. Wanting to see his kids though, he asked Catherine to take them, take him to where they were at. Catherine seemed to lead him on some kind of a wild goose chase, taking him to different places and never finding the kids. Finally, Troy got frustrated and started going towards a police station and she panicked and asked to stop at a fast food restaurant first. It was while she was at this fast food restaurant that she texted her mom saying that the kids were fine and then Catherine disappeared. She was found several days later wandering the streets. She was taken into custody after this. Part two will be up tonight. This girl was murdered by her ex-boyfriend after police fined her for wasting their time when she reported him for stalking her. This case actually makes my blood boil. Shana Grice was a British teenager who met Michael Lane in 2015 when they both worked at Brighton at Fire Alarms. They began a relationship, but Michael became obsessed with her. When she broke up with him, he refused to accept this and chillingly told his friend she'll pay for what she's done. Shana had got back with an ex-boyfriend, Ashley Cook, but refusing to accept this, Michael put a tracker on her car to monitor her movements. On the 8th of February 2016, Shana received unwanted flowers from Michael and also noticed damage to her vehicle. Frightened, she rang the police for help. In March, Michael snatched her phone and grabbed her hair in an altercation between the two. He was arrested on suspicion of assault, but later released. Infuriatingly, Shana was given a £90 fine from police. They said she had wasted their time because she didn't disclose that she had previously been in a relationship with him. In July the same year, Michael stole a key to her house and let himself in. Disturbingly, he watched her while he thought she was sleeping. Shana was actually awake and was hiding under her duvet after hearing a man breathing in her room. When she heard him leave, she looked out of the window and saw him walking away. He was arrested for theft and told to stay away from her. However, this obviously did not deter him. The next day, Shana got seven calls from a blocked number and when she answered the phone, she heard heavy breathing. However, police told her there were no further lines of inquiry. On the 12th of July, she rang police as she was being followed by Michael. They claimed that the incident was low risk and they did nothing. On the 4th of August, she saw Michael hanging around outside her house. By this point, she was too worried to ring police as they obviously weren't taking her seriously and had given her a fine. 21 days later, Michael let himself into Shana's house when she was home alone. Shockingly, he slit her throat and then set fire to her bedroom while she was in it. He was arrested that day, but he claimed that he walked into her house, found her body, panicked and ran off. He was eventually sentenced to 25 years in prison. Shana's parents said that their daughter would still be alive if Sussex police had acted on their complaints, which I totally agree with. Thirty-five-year-old Ershan Findikolu is the mastermind behind one of the most intricate bank robberies in history. A crime so brazen, he posed with a pile of cash on his chest. Secret Service agent Scott Serafian says millions were taken from ATMs in New York City alone. Block after block, ATM after ATM, they hit them all. They had it mapped out and they knew that Broadway had a large number of ATMs in close proximity to each other. From Turkey, Findikolu hacked into the computers of international banks, 
stole account information, and then sent ATM numbers to criminal gangs around the world he'd recruited online. He also removed all withdrawal limits from the accounts. Gang members, seen here on surveillance cameras, then went to work, hitting machines from Tokyo to London to New York, where Ken Primo is a Secret Service agent. They came and emptied these. Yes, multiple transactions, put your card in, put your pins in, take out the limit, put your card in, put your pin in, take out your limit. Back in Turkey, Findikolu was watching it all. He was watching so that he could tell who was withdrawing how much so that he'd know how much money he was supposed to get back. The first hit happened in February of 2011. 15,000 transactions in 18 countries. $10 million were stolen. The second hit was December 2012. 5,000 transactions in 20 countries. $5 million were withdrawn. Then the big score, February 19, 2013. In a little over 10 hours, Cruz made some 36,000 transactions in 24 countries for a take of $40 million in cash. The thieves sent most of the money back to Findicolu, but started showing off their take, cash and expensive watches. Their end came at a mob movie staple, a New York diner, where police arrested one gang member, carrying almost $1 million. But Dave Beach, who runs the Secret Service office in New York, says most of the money has not been recovered. It's gone. Just gone. It was cash. It's untraceable. PD's had the boot on this tow truck for almost two weeks, preventing Jose Rodriguez, pictured here, from doing his job. Ironically, his boss says he got the boot because he was doing his job. May 30th, the company Finest Towing was alerted that a bank wanted this car on Richmond Terrace for repossession. Rodriguez hooked it up for a tow and abruptly found out the driver is a detective at the 120th precinct across the street. Rodriguez's manager, Caroline DiStefano, had just offered authorized the tow. He called me right back and I, he didn't speak. I just heard him say, I didn't see a plaque in the window. He hung up. I knew it had to be a cop's call because I heard him say a plaque. So then he was surrounded by um, a couple of off-duty cops and then they called over other cops and he got arrested for having a stolen car when we had a repossession order for it. The detective allegedly offered to pay Rodriguez for the three missed car payments, but Finest Towing says it's illegal for it to collect debt. Only the bank can do that, and only the bank can authorize a car to be released. But allegedly, police took the car off the tow truck themselves and put Rodriguez in jail for about a day. He used his his authority to drop the car himself. DiStefano says the officers confiscated the truck's cameras, but this photo of an officer dismantling a recording device was automatically uploaded to a storage cloud. Rodriguez says when he was first arrested, he was charged with a felony for possession of stolen property. But then when he appeared in court, his charges were changed to misdemeanors. The Staten Island District Attorney charges Rodriguez's truck did not display its license plate properly and he did not have a New York City towing license. The city's Department of Consumer Affairs says drivers who pick up tows are required to have a Department of Consumer Affairs license, but fine is towing and several others we spoke with argue it depends on the tow. You don't need a DCA license for repossession jobs because those are considered private, unlike for high toes, such as when a car is disabled or in an accident. Monday on New York One, the mayor was asked about the incident. I haven't seen the details, but if it is that kind of thing, that's unacceptable, and there would be huge consequences for those cops. Rodriguez and his attorney won't speak on camera, but they met with the NYPD Internal Affairs Bureau last night. The NYPD declined our multiple requests for an interview. In the St. George section of Staten Island, Lisa Rosner, CBS 2 News. Katie's parents traced her steps, and it was confirmed that she did indeed buy the toilet paper at the dollar store and began walking home at 3.40 p.m. Neighbors in the area saw Katie at around 4 p.m. walking along the train tracks on her way to her home. This meant that Katie should have been home shortly after 4. When she didn't make it home, however, her mom wasn't immediately concerned. Katie was known for chatting with friends along the way, and it wouldn't have been strange for her to play for a little while before going back home. When 7 p.m. rolled around, her family started becoming concerned and tried calling around to see if anyone had seen Katie. 
When they were unable to get hold of anyone who they thought would have been with Katie, that's when they decided to call the police. The police were initially reluctant to declare Katie a missing person, believing that she was probably at a friend's place, or even that she may have run away. Kidnappings were practically unheard of in these parts of town, so police believed that Katie would show up. Her parents and the community as a whole were however convinced that foul play was involved. Katie wasn't the type of child to just run away from home, and she wasn't known to stay out this late. The community immediately launched a search party consisting of more than 120 members of the community, and they all began searching for any trace of Katie. After 18 hours of searching, and without any significant clues on Katie's whereabouts, the police knew that it was unlikely that she was at a friend's place, and they officially declared Katie a missing person. They allocated all of their resources toward the case hoping to find someone who would be able to shed some light on the case. And then, two days after Katie went missing, their persistence finally paid off, and they got their first big break in the case. A neighbor called the police and told them that she'd seen Katie in a white Ford F-150 pickup truck between 4.30 and 5 o'clock. She didn't recognize the driver of the vehicle, but she was certain that it was Katie in the passenger seat. The driver of the vehicle was described as a white male of slender built between the ages of 18 and 22 years old. A composite image of the suspect was generated, and the public was requested to come forward with any information which may help police. Unfortunately, no solid leads were uncovered. Police also searched the records for all owners of a white Ford F-150 living in the area at the time, and they then cross-referenced that list with a list of all registered sex offenders. They then visited every single one of those people where they were required to provide police with a statement and a satisfactory alibi. But once again, they had no solid leads. If the person who has abducted Katie is watching this, do not harm her. Just let her go and let her come back to her family. This is part two of the Ant Hill Kids cult. If you haven't seen part one, I suggest you go ahead and watch that first. Like I said in the first video, massive trigger warning. Like, if you can't handle disturbing things, even if you can handle disturbing things, you might actually be pretty disturbed by this. So we left off at the part where Rock told everybody that he had powers to heal people. He decided to test his healing powers on a woman named Geraldine who had leukemia. She ended up dying after Rock prescribed her grape juice and organic food to treat her leukemia. Of course, Rock had to explain himself now because he told everyone that he could heal people. He told everyone that he went into Geraldine's room and she died, but then he kissed her on the forehead and brought her back to life, but then God told him that it was her time to go so he let her die again. And surprisingly, people believed him. I don't know how, but they did. I just find it funny how ridiculous this man is and how they believed him, you know what I mean? Rock continued to expand his following, but then eventually got kicked out of the church because he tried to take it over, but the church leadership was not having it. This is when he started his cult and convinced his followers to leave their entire lives and come with him. He convinced them to leave their jobs, education, and even cut ties with their families, because nothing mattered anymore since Christ was returning anyway. The power Rock had over his followers was so strong that even when some of their family members tried to convince them not to go and not to cut ties with them, they still went anyway because of their complete love and devotion to Rock, which I don't understand. Rock's second wife, Giselle, was actually one of the cult members, and she joined along with a few women, men, and children, but obviously the children had no choice. Since Geraldine's death, Rock knew that the police were pretty aware of him now, and so did his cult members, so they decided to pack up and move somewhere else in the middle of nowhere. They wanted to find somewhere to settle down permanently. They decided to settle down and build their commune on a mountainside called Eternal Mountain. Rock told his followers that the world was going to be ending in February 1979, which was only a few months away at this point. Rock told his followers that in order to survive the apocalypse, they needed to move to this remote location and obey all of his rules. Rock made his followers build a camp from scratch and find their own food, and he just sat there and watched them the whole time. This is actually how they got the name the Ant Hill Kids, because while he was watching them, he said that they looked like little ants working for him. Rock rationed everyone's food, but of course he got to eat whatever he wanted to eat. If anyone complained that they were hungry, they got even less food. You're gonna have to come back for part three to hear more. 
On Friday, my phone was blowing up saying, have you heard there's a suspect that was arrested for the murders on Gilgo Beach? And he's a dad. In 1995, my father was arrested for serial murder and I was 16 years old when he was arrested. One thing that I've been following now since the suspect was arrested is all the articles coming out about his supposed double life. And I could speak on this. I'm also not alone in being the only person who could speak about this. There are other daughters of serial killers that could speak about this. And I can tag some of them in here that are open about talking about their experience. So like the suspect, when my father was away from our family is when he would strike and kill his victims. And I'm reading reports that this suspect would wait till his family was on vacation to lure and kill his victim. This suspect also reminds me of serial killer Robert Yates and the fact that he would have his family on vacation and uh, strike and, and kill his victims. One victim in particular, he buried at his property by the window of his daughter. Adjectives being used uh, for the suspect are creepy and weird and that he stole oranges from a Whole Foods. Those are the same adjectives that I would use for my father as well. I believe those adjectives are caused by the narcissism, the grandioseness that they feel entitled. Um, it's just part of their anti-social personality disorder. A profiler could speak more about that. Having lived with uh, a serial killer, I can speak on some other things. So in my case, my father used his family as a mask of insanity. He actually would lure some of his victims by talking about how he was a dad and how he had just been to my birthday party and that would get them comfortable with him. I'm seeing now that everybody is in shock, like he looks so normal. And that's what is so crazy about these cases is that a killer like this, a serial killer can live amongst us and you don't even know, not even his family could know. And this is why I say family members of perpetrators or killers or serial killers are victims too, because they are blindsided. They live with the killer, not knowing. And people always come up to you and say, how did you not know you lived with them? They're very good at hiding their double life. So when I see news reports like this, another killer found, I'm always grateful that the police and detectives are doing their job and they're finding these serial killers or finding these killers. But I always think about the families of the killers too, because while there's some closure for the victim's families, there's also a new unrest for the perpetrator's family. They're now uncovering a whole nother world, another life that was happening in their midst. Let's talk about what happened to Jerry Michael Williams. He grew up in North Tallahassee, Florida, and was a popular high school football player and the class president. He was also dating this cheerleader named Denise Morell. When Mike wasn't hanging out with his girlfriend Denise, he was hanging out with his best friend Brian Winchester. When the three of them graduated from high school, they all attended Florida State University, which helped Mike continue his relationship with Denise and his friendship with Brian all throughout his adulthood. After they graduated from college, Denise and Mike tied the knot and officially got married on December 20th, 1994. Mike ended up getting a job as a property appraiser and was making over $200,000 a year. There was actually a joke around the office where people would say, oh, I wish I was married to Mike because he was just such a great husband and so romantic to Denise. In 1999, the couple gave birth to their first and only daughter, Ansley. At the time, the local news was doing a segment on babies born near Mother's Day and they actually interviewed Mike and Denise. This week. We're just totally overwhelmed. She was due Tuesday and she would have made me wait a whole nother year for Mother's Day. So she came yesterday so I could enjoy this day today with her. It was unbelievable. I have a whole new respect for my wife and women in general and what they go through to bring a, a new child, new life into After the birth of their daughter, Mike's boss actually told Mike that he should think about amping up his life insurance policy. Mike did love to go duck hunting, and his boss felt that that was dangerous and that now he had a family and needed to think about their future. Mike agreed to this, and he reached out to his friend Brian, who was an insurance salesman, and they worked on getting a new policy set up. In the end, Mike ended up taking out a $1.75 million life insurance policy. So then, on December 16, 2000, Mike had plans to go duck hunting in the morning and told his wife Denise that he would be back by noon. Him and Denise were actually going to celebrate their anniversary, so he was just going to go hunting and then come back and begin the celebration. Some time goes by, and it's now 30 minutes past noon, and Mike still has not returned from his hunting trip. Denise starts to get worried, so she starts blowing up Michael's phone, but he doesn't pick up. 
Then she decides to call her father and she calls Brian to see if they have heard from Mike. Neither her father or Brian have heard from Mike, but Brian says that he will go out to the lake and start searching for Mike. So Brian and a couple of other people go out to Lake Seminole and begin looking for Mike. However, there was a huge storm coming their way, so they had to call off the search and move it to the next morning. The next morning, Brian and his father go back to Lake Seminole, and that's when they find Mike's car abandoned. Then, just a couple hundred yards away, they find Mike's boat, which was also abandoned. Brian and the search party begin looking around the area near Mike's boat, and they quickly realize that it's surrounded by very large alligators. This is when people started to theorize that maybe Mike was driving his boat and he accidentally hit a stump. Then either he fell overboard and his waders quickly filled with water and he drowned, or these alligators got to him. Okay, part two should be up now. This is the case of 16-year-old Enrique Rios and how he was set up by his friend. Enrique was born on January 2nd, 2000 and lived in Esparto, California with his mother Lola, his stepfather, and his younger sister. His family says that Enrique loved his friends, he loved his family, and he just loved life. Now, of course, no one is perfect and Enrique did run into some trouble in his teenage years. He ended up getting into a fight at school and this led to him being on probation. However, as part of his probation, the family found a program that allowed him to go to school in the morning and then go to work in the afternoon. At this job, he would learn trade skills and he was getting paid $800 every other week and Enrique absolutely loved this job. His life was turning around and he was so excited for what the future would hold. But unfortunately, that would all change on Sunday, October 16th, 2016. That Sunday, the Rios family was getting ready for bed. At around 9 p.m., Enrique walked into his mother's room and told her goodnight. Lula says that Enrique was wearing black shorts and a white t-shirt, which is what he would typically wear to bed. Everyone went to sleep and the next morning on Monday, October 17th, she woke up and realized that her son was gone. Lola started calling her son, but all of the calls went straight to voicemail. However, after a few hours, she did receive a text message from her son. In this message, Enrique said that he was on his way to school and that he had accidentally fallen asleep at a friend's house. Lola asked him, okay, what about your uniform? Because he had left the uniform at her house. Enrique said that the friend he was staying with was also part of the program and that he had an extra uniform for him to borrow. Now, Lola says that when she saw that text message from Enrique, she immediately knew that something was wrong. So a couple of hours later, she called the school and asked if Enrique had shown up and they said that he had never shown up to class. She continued calling and texting her son and just wanted to speak to him on the phone and see if everything was okay. Eventually in the afternoon, she received one final text message from her son. This message said that he needed to go away and that he was under too much pressure and just needed some space. Lola read that message and immediately knew that this wasn't her son. Someone else had sent her this message. So she immediately called police and reported her son as missing. However, the police didn't really take her seriously. They classified Enrique as a runaway and they didn't really do anything about it. It wasn't until three weeks later that police would finally take his case seriously. This was when Enrique's friend, 17-year-old Elijah Moore, also went missing. Elijah was last seen on Friday, November 4th, 2016, just three weeks after Enrique's disappearance and just a day after his 17th birthday. As soon as Lola found out about Elijah's disappearance, she immediately knew that this was connected to her son's case. And police agreed with her. They thought it was strange that these two students and co-workers disappeared within weeks of each other. Both families began asking the public to come forward with any information about the teen's whereabouts. And someone did. Someone submitted an anonymous tip letting the parents know that both teens had been kidnapped. And that they needed to look into Jesus Campos and Chandel Shannon. Right before his disappearance, Elijah was seen on camera cashing in a check on Main Street in Woodland. And with this, police started to put together a timeline for what happened. Okay, go to part two. This is the case of Dylan Lenz. He met a girl on Snapchat and then stabbed her and ran her over twice with his car in a Walmart parking lot. Dylan and Abby met on October 15th of this year. They met on Snapchat and decided to meet up, so Abby sent Dylan her address and he went to her house to go pick her up. Their first stop was Walmart, so they walked around and got back in Dylan's car and they were getting ready to head to another store. Well, this is when Dylan grabbed Abby by the throat and then stabbed her in the shoulder multiple times. Then, with him being in a panic, he unlocked the car doors and let Abby get out of the car and she started running and screaming for help. Then, Dylan freaked out even more, now being worried that he was going to get in trouble for an attempted murder, so he took his car and started chasing her. While Abby was running away, she was trying to run downhill and she tripped, and this is when Dylan ran her over with his car twice. A 911 call was made by a witness and they saw a car that was making bouncing motions and squealing their tires. On the floor, it appeared to be something that looked like a human body. The police rushed over there, but not before Dylan fled. He saw a car that was coming in his direction and he got scared and drove off. 
When they got there, they saw that Abby had life-threatening injuries, so they rushed her to the hospital and she was later airlifted to UW's Children's Hospital in Wisconsin. The next day, they went to go talk to Abby and they saw that she had a spinal injury where she had no movement below her waist, both of her ankles were broken, and she had road rash from her shoulders down to her feet on top of other injuries. She is still in the ICU and I'm going to leave a link to the GoFundMe in the comments. Since Dylan fled the scene, they had a look at the surveillance footage from Walmart and they were able to get the license plate number which was linked to Dylan, so they went over to his residence. When they got there, they saw that there was blood on Dylan's car, there was grass jammed into the car frame, and that there was a broken license plate where the rest of it was found at the crime scene. They also found blood on the inside of the car, which Dylan's mom said was from the victim. Dylan was immediately arrested and admitted that it was premeditated and said, quote, While I was in the store, I was like, this is the last day she's going to be alive. This is the last night of her life. I was out of control. I wasn't thinking. My body just took over. After the ordeal, he also texted his friend saying, Oh no, I'm in big trouble. I really messed up this time. I did something really bad and I'm going away for a long time for this. He also said during questioning that if he didn't flee, he was going to put her body in a trash bag and throw it away or he would bury it. After two weeks in jail, a $150,000 bond was posted and he made bail. Contingent upon his bail, he was told that he was not able to contact Abby or her family either directly or indirectly. He was also told that he had to stay at home with the exception of going to school, work, court hearings, or doctor's appointments. Since his release, he entered a treatment program that was suggested by his doctors, and he is not going to school or work. Dylan is being charged with first-degree attempted homicide, and his maximum time in jail would be 60 years. His preliminary hearing is November 17th. Hi, my name is Ethan, and here is everything you need to know in under one minute. On the night of June 29th, 2023, police received a 911 call, and when they arrived to the home, they saw a 17-year-old boy who was suffering from multiple gunshot wounds. He was fully conscious at the time, and he quickly informed police that it was his mother, 34-year-old Jaquana Butler. She later told investigators that they were, quote, arguing over a video game console, which escalated to gunfire. How does that escalate to that? Also, let me preface that he had multiple wounds which means that she didn't just do it one time and immediately regret it. She kept going. Needless to say, she was arrested and is now awaiting trial. Elisa Navarro has fled with a man named Eddie Davis. Images of them moving has surfaced online. Here's a couple things that I found really interesting about these pictures. One thing I noticed about this picture is if you look at Alicia, she seems happy. She seems like she's smiling. She seems like she's having a good time moving. From what I heard, I believe that she's still going to stay in Montana. Here's another thing that I noticed about the pictures. And correct me if I'm wrong, but does that over here look like a card seat? I mean, maybe that was already there. Could be from another family member, right? But why is that here? Now, I know there were rumors saying that there was a baby, but I think those rumors are false. In this picture, you can kind of get a better look of how Eddie Davis looks like. And compared to her, I mean, she kind of still looks like she's 14 in my opinion. 
less than an hour ago, we were here and about five plain clothes investigators, we don't know if they're local, state, federal, they were inside and we saw a lot of activity inside the home and the home was lit up. So we were able to peek in some of the windows, but we saw those men inside the home in the two particular rooms uh, where the murders took place. We did not see them leaving with any materials. I asked them a couple of times, why are they back? They did not answer me. They pulled away in two vehicles. One had a Washington state plate. The other had an Ohio, uh, Idaho plate. Um, but that is all we can tell you. But we did see a lot of activity. This house was lit up for nearly an hour. They were inside. We don't know why. Nothing seemed to be removed. But as you know... As how long have you been here now? Um, about a year and a half. Okay. So how's life here now? What's what's day in the life like for you? It's not so bad. I go to school. I have a job. What's your job? Um, my job is working on my housing unit, janitorial services. Uh -huh. So I clean. Um, I go to school in the morning. Mm -hmm. I love going to the library. The administration here, they seem really dedicated to keeping the women here safe and to, mm -hmm. to helping them really rehabilitate and better themselves. They offer free education, and especially for someone like me that came here with a second grade education, never been to real school, um, I've, I'm very close to getting my GED. And you have family support. I do, uh -huh. I do. My father, he has some guilt, and I try and tell him, don't feel guilty because you're in my life now. You're here now, and that's what's important to me. Gypsy, thanks so much for talking to me, okay? Thank you so much, Dr. Right. Bill. I was raped and beaten to death by six men. Hi, my name is Elena Hembry, and my story is one of the most severe child abuse cases since I died less than two months ago, where I was only 17 months old. It all started on July 28, 2023, in Middlesbrough, Kentucky, when my mom, Erica Lawson, sold me for drugs to six different men and couldn't remember who she left me with. I was beaten with a baseball bat and raped to death so badly that when my mom found me, I had stopped breathing and was unresponsive. My mom did nothing and waited for 45 minutes before she brought me to the hospital and stayed for an hour before she abandoned me as they put me on life support and put me on a life flight so they could transfer me to a hospital in Tennessee since they were not capable of giving me the medical care I needed. Once the flight landed, I was pronounced brain dead and succumbed to my injuries. My dad and grandparents came to the hospital and were able to say their last goodbyes. Initial hearing. Thank you, Your Honor. At this time... Any issues? Any discovery problems? Anything we need to talk about? In the early morning hours of July 31st, 2022, her purpose was to kill Dominic Russo in the Colonel Flanagan. No reasonable fact finder could view the totality. In the early hours of July 31st, 2022, Mackenzie, her boyfriend Dominic, and his friend Davian Flanagan took a fateful car ride ending in Dominic's and Davian's death. She drove the car 100 miles per hour into a brick building. Killing Dominic and Davian, Mackenzie managed to survive this. The teen's chilling TikTok video resurfaced after her conviction, in which she boasts about her feelings of immortality. I'm not even cool, I'm just one of those girls that can do a lot of drugs and not die. She was sentenced to, to concurrent 15 years to life sentences. She was found guilty on 12 counts, including four of murder, four of felonious assault, two of aggravated vehicular homicide one of drug possession and one of possessing criminal tools. The lady on the plane was actually right and there was something wrong with the passenger next to her. Part two. Guys, I have a ton of information coming out about this and to get part one and possibly part three, make sure and click the plus sign. 
There have been tons of theories of what actually happened to this woman who was freaking out, but now we're hearing more reports. And the reports are that the people who were sitting next to her said the guy that was sitting next to her, something was wrong with him. Something made even them uncomfortable. And now we have new video footage of that. And I'm gonna show you here. <laughs> Okay guys, after seeing this and seeing the footage from part one, I want to know, what do you guys think? Sound up in the comments, click the plus sign, I've got more coming. This killer cannibal is now a free man. This case will put you off public transport for life. In July 2008, Tim McLean was minding his own business on a Greyhound Canada bus. He was returning home from work and all seemed to be normal. That was until another passenger got on the bus at around 6.55pm. I feel like we've all had those annoying moments on public transport when it's fairly quiet but somebody just decides to come and sit right next to you, even though there's other free seats. Well, that happened to Tim, except Vince Lee, who came and sat next to him, had a sinister plan. Tim had headphones in and he was dozing quietly in the seat. Suddenly, Vince began attacking him with a knife. It was a brutal attack in front of other passengers who were completely stunned. The bus driver pulled over and everybody fled the bus apart from obviously poor Tim who was completely trapped and being attacked by this man. Without being too graphic on TikTok, Tim's body parts were being removed. Vince even started consuming parts of him. Vince even held up one of his body parts to show shocked onlookers outside of the bus. Eventually, police arrived and there was a standoff. By this point, Tim was being eaten in front of police officers. Many eyewitnesses talked about how strange Vince was during this attack. And even though he was committing such a horrible, violent act, he didn't seem to be angry. People said it just seemed like he was just a robot carrying out this attack. He was finally tasered and taken off the bus. And by the time this got taken to court, he pled insanity. He explained that God had told him to do it. And the judge actually agreed and said that he wasn't guilty due to reason of insanity. He was admitted to a mental health facility, but he was actually released in 2017. Picture the filmmaker took of Nicholas Barclay was compared to younger photos of him, and what he found gave him chills. The boy's ears did not match, and considering that ears don't change with age, he took his findings to the police. Five months after Nicholas returned home, his case was reopened, and this time, the FBI was involved. They took his fingerprints and DNA, and they found out that the boy that the Barclays believed to be their beloved Nicholas was actually a man in his 20s named Frederick Pierre Bordeaux, a French con artist who had been scamming people for years with more than 500 different identities. He was nicknamed the Chameleon. But despite the revelation, the Barclays actually refused to believe the DNA test results. Even after Frederic's court appearance and his admission of guilt when he was sentenced to six years in prison, Frederic would later state to investigators that he could not believe that the Barclays accepted him as Nicholas so easily. He said they had to know he wasn't really Nicholas, but instead they decided to play along the entire time. He revealed that when he met with the sister for the first time that she fed him information about the family that would allow him to pass that test and return home to the US. He also said that Jason, Nicholas's brother, was the only person that never accepted him. He never played along with the game and all that Jason told Frederic when he first met him were the words, good luck. This raised further suspicions about Jason, especially considering that he was initially a suspect for the crime. Just a few months after Nicholas had disappeared in 1993, Jason made an odd phone call to the police. 
He claimed he heard his little brother trying to break into the garage, and when police came to investigate, they found nothing. They initially became suspicious of Jason because oftentimes somebody who has committed murder may try to make it seem as though the victim is still alive. And this is exactly what Frederick and investigators believed that the family, or possibly just Jason, had killed Nicholas. They had accepted Frederick so willingly because it was the perfect cover up. Unfortunately, before Jason could be investigated as a suspect to Nicholas's disappearance, he died of a drug overdose, and the case of missing child Nicholas. Nicholas Barclay would never be solved. Peter has the details of what happened in that courtroom today. Dozens of family members and friends of Susanna Morales showed up to the hearing this morning. Also in the gallery were the parents and grandparents of Miles Bryant. There wasn't an open seat in that hearing, and understandably so, emotions were high. Good morning, Dr. Miles Bryant. How you doing, ma'am? Okay. Is that a yes? Yes, ma'am. As Bryant entered the courtroom handcuffed with his waist shackled, one of his family members broke down in tears and walked out of the courtroom. The prosecution then described incidents of Bryan using his position of power as a Doraville police officer to commit, quote, sexually deviant acts, including breaking into women's homes and stealing their underwear, and on one occasion accessing a woman's phone to steal sexual videos. While he was on duty and in uniform, asked her to utilize her cell phone because he needed to log into his bank. And instead of doing so, he accessed her videos and sent himself videos of conducting sexual activity on her phone. The prosecution continued to describe other incidents, including the stalking of Alicia Bates back in December. Bates previously talked with 11 Alive about the incident. Uh, afterwards, the defendant repeatedly showed up to her apartment, would put his ear to the door to try to listen in on conversations inside. The prosecution saying while Bryant doesn't have a criminal record, he's displayed a pattern of threatening behavior towards women for years. He is a danger to women in this community. He is a uh, has has not upheld the oath that he took to protect and serve both the citizens of Doraville and the state of Georgia. Bryant's attorney did push back against the state's claims. As is always in a criminal case, there is another side to some of these allegations. The judge quickly decided to deny Bryant's bond. He is facing multiple charges, including kidnapping and murder. In Gwinnick, she must have been out of her head. One guy was shot like nine times. I put the 95 tag on his toe. And a week later, I'm talking to his wife at the precinct. I said, I'm really sorry to hear about your husband. She goes, what do you mean? I go, well, he got shot nine fucking times. I put the right. 95 tag, the DOA. I put the DOA tag on his toe. She says, he's over there on the phone making a phone call. I put the 95 tag on his fucking toe and turned out he wasn't dead. To know in under one minute. On June 26, 2023, Patrick Profright and his wife were having an argument. Now they had just had a baby that was only three weeks old, so the argument was early in the morning, which is understandable because they are suffering from lack of sleep and just a whole new adjustment. While Patrick's wife was holding the baby, Patrick entered the room holding a crossbow. The mood immediately shifted and trigger warning, it's about to get dark. He allegedly raised the bow and shot at his wife. When he did it, accidentally hit his three weeks old baby and his wife. He then pulled the arrow out of his wife and begged her not to call 911, but when she did regardless, he fled the scene. Thankfully, he was found and arrested and charged with second degree murder and attempted, and his wife was okay. Unfortunately, the baby did pass away. Attention, âme sensible s'abstenir. Cette mère a tué son enfant de la pire des manières. Nous sommes aux états unis dans la banlieue de Chicago, et une mère nommée China Arnold décide de prendre une baby cisrice pour passer un peu de bon temps avec son homme. Ils sortent, vont au restaurant et boivent une bouteille d'alcool. Sauf que là, une embrouille éclate et son mec lui soutient qu'il n'est pas le père de l'enfant et qu'elle l'aurait trompé. Énervée de cette discussion, elle décidera de rentrer à son appartement et lui fera la même chose quelques heures plus tard. Lorsqu'il arrive, il est extrêmement fatigué et s'endort directement. Et c'est le lendemain matin qu'il fera une terrible découverte. Il retrouve son bébé sur la table, complètement froid, avec des traces d'hématomes partout. Il décide alors de l'amener d'urgence à l'hôpital et les docteurs annoncent alors la triste nouvelle à China et son homme, leur bébé est décédé. Et ce n'est que quelques semaines après que nous allons finalement découvrir l'envers du décor. En effet, en rentrant de cette soirée où elle s'était énervée avec son mec, China a décidé de se venger et de lui prendre la chose qui lui ferait le plus mal. Elle a alors pris son bébé et l'a mis au micro-ondes. Elle a laissé le micro-ondes tourner pendant au moins deux minutes, ce qui a brûlé les parties externes et internes du bébé, qui est sûrement mort dans d'atroces souffrances. Elle a ensuite sorti du micro-ondes et posé dans son landau et attendra jusqu'au lendemain matin pour aller à l'hôpital avec. Mais malheureusement, il était trop tard. I lost my life in a stingray attack and my journey ended in the depths of the ocean. I'm Steve Irwin and I want to share my story with you. 
I grew up surrounded by wildlife in Australia from a very young age. My family ran the Queensland Reptile and Fauna Park, a reptile zoo, and that's where my passion for nature and animals was born. Animals began to flourish. I've always been an adventurer and had an insatiable desire to learn about Australian wildlife. In 1992, I started hosting a television show called The Crocodile Hunter with my wife, Terry Irwin. This show has given me the opportunity to take you viewers with me on my wildlife adventures. My approach was unique. I got up close and personal with dangerous animals like crocodiles, snakes, and spiders to educate people about these amazing and often misunderstood creatures. I believe that by getting to know animals better, we can learn to respect and protect them. My life changed forever in September 2006 while filming a documentary on the Great Barrier Reef. While swimming near a stingray, I accidentally hit my tail. It was an unexpected tragedy that took my life. My death shocked the world and left a void in the wildlife conservation community. If you want the second part, leave a comment below. My name is Tamara Jenkins, and my grandson was a serial killer who murdered 45 people. And I was just as shocked as everybody else was. When my grandson first moved into my house, it's because his mama and his daddy were too scared of him. And I said, what's there to be scared of? He's just a little boy, always smiling. He would smile at anything. He'd smile at a car crash. Or he'd show up to school with a knife, threatening to skin one of his teachers. And I just said, come on now, y'all. Boys will be boys. Well, he certainly was a ladies' man, got his looks from his grandpa, I'll tell you that, because he, you, you know, he was probably beating them girls off with a stick, and eventually it did turn out that is exactly what he was doing down in my basement. He would just take girls down there, and I'd say, I don't want to know, you know, the good Lord is watching, probably doing some hanky-panky, but he was murdering down there. Sure, there were some signs that I definitely missed, for example, you know, we went through 15 cats when he lived with me, so... I just chalked it up to he loved him too hard. You know, he'd squeeze him till their brains pop out. And I was just like, he's just such a sweet boy. He just has too much love to give, you know. So the cats just kept dying and I kept getting more because I thought, I don't know what I thought. I'm in shock. He was in church every Sunday, which it turns out that's where he found many of his victims. He'd take them back home to my place. I'd fix some potatoes and then he'd go kill them in the basement. Here's the second part of the body cam footage of Chad Dordman, the monster, the so-called father who unalived his three sons in a way that I cannot even describe on here. But before I show you the video, the cop and the way he reacts in this video and how he talks to the suspect is 100% how I would talk to him. That's a little, that's a little. Can you get the wallet out of my back pocket? And shut up, dude. You had to ride the main side with the fucking easy. Yes, sir. I've never encountered anything that is even close to what Gypsy has gone through. Her mother appeared to have taken great steps to keep Gypsy in a very juvenile role, making her act several years younger than her actual age. It appears that Gypsy was not even aware of what her actual age was. I called her for her 18th birthday and Didi said, don't tell her she's 18, you know. She, I'm like, what do you mean don't tell her she's 18? She said, no, she's 18, it's her 18th birthday. I was, she, she don't know she's 18, she's, you know. I thought it was weird, you know. I, she, I mean, I always did know that she, she told me her mental capacity was 
you know, like five years behind. You know, when she was like 15, she was like, oh yeah, you know, her learning is coming along, but she's like, you know, mentally at, at like a nine or 10 year old. She looks like she would be 10 and 11 and she was probably like 21, 22. I wonder what she was thinking. On October 22, 2022, shortly after 10 a.m., 30-year-old Nestor Hernandez walked into the Methodist Dallas Medical Center in Texas to visit his longtime girlfriend, Selena Villatoro, who had just given birth to their first child the day before, and to the casual observer it seemed that Nestor was there to visit his newborn son. The truth of the matter, though, was that Nestor was there for a much more sinister reason. He had spent most of the morning drinking at home, and as usual, his alcohol-fueled paranoia got the best of him. He convinced himself that his girlfriend was cheating on him, so despite being on parole and wearing an ankle monitor, he decided that he needed to confront her immediately. As he entered the labor and delivery unit of the hospital with a beer in hand, he made his way to Selena's room, and what would follow was a swift and terrifying escalation of matters. After unsuccessfully searching for the non-existent man he believed Selena was seeing, Nestor suddenly whipped out a gun and repeatedly pistol-whipped Selena. As hospital staff came around to check in on what was happening, Nestor opened fire and tragically killed two healthcare workers, and it seemed that he had even more innocent victims in mind. Can you come out? Over here, please, come out! Come outside! Okay, I'm Robert. What's your name, partner? What's your name? Talk to me. Okay. Okay, listen. We can work this out, partner, okay? All I want to do is just get the people outside, please. We can work this out. Just let some outside, okay? This killer cannibal is now a free man. This case will put you off public transport for life. In July 2008, Tim McLean was minding his own business on a Greyhound Canada bus. He was returning home from work and all seemed to be normal. That was until another passenger got on the bus at around 6.55pm. I feel like we've all had those annoying moments on public transport when it's fairly quiet but somebody just decides to come and sit right next to you even though there's other free seats. Well, that happened to Tim, except Vince Lee, who came and sat next to him, had a sinister plan. Tim had headphones in and he was dozing quietly in the seat. Suddenly, Vince began attacking him with a knife. It was a brutal attack in front of other passengers who were completely stunned. The bus driver pulled over and everybody fled the bus, apart from obviously poor Tim, who was completely trapped and being attacked by this man. Without being too graphic on TikTok, Tim's body parts were being removed. Vince even started consuming parts of him. Vince even held up one of his body parts to show shocked onlookers outside of the bus. Eventually, police arrived and there was a standoff. By this point, Tim was being eaten in front of police officers. Many eyewitnesses talked about how strange Vince was during this attack, and even though he was committing such a horrible, violent act, he didn't seem to be angry. People said it just seemed like he was just a robot carrying out this attack. He was finally tasered and taken off the bus, and by the time this got taken to court, he pled insanity. He explained that God had told him to do it, and the judge actually agreed and said that he wasn't guilty due to reason of insanity. He was admitted to a mental health facility but he was actually released in 2017. Update, James ruining the vacations with her TikToks. That was the last TikTok ever posted by TikToker Anthony Barajas aka Anthony Michael. On July 26, 2021, Anthony and his friend Riley were seeing a movie. On that evening they were seeing the ironically violent film The Forever Purge which itself is a critique on American violence. 
On that day, the two of them were just sitting inside of the theater enjoying the film when suddenly they were both shot in the back of the head. Now, sadly, Riley Goodrich, who was 18 at the time, would die at the scene, but Anthony, who was 19 at the time, was taken to a hospital but passed away a few days later. But why did this happen? Well, it's not a very clear story. So this is Joseph Jimenez, and he was actually arrested the day after the murder. He was the guy who pulled the trigger. Now, Joseph's friends were actually in the movie theater. There were only six people in the theater at the time. And they said that during the movie, Joseph was acting strange. He was mumbling to himself. And at one point, he left the theater and came back in with some sort of a package. Joseph's friends then left the theater because they were afraid of what he might do. And a few moments later, they saw Joseph running out of the side door, getting into his vehicle and speeding away. So it turns out that Joseph had just randomly decided to murder Riley and Anthony. There was no motivation. He didn't know these two. He just decided he had to kill somebody. And strangely, their bodies weren't discovered until after the movie was over because there was only six people in the theater, including Joseph, his three friends, and these two. So according to Joseph, he was hearing voices that were saying his friends and family were going to be killed if he didn't take a life. He also stated that he wished he didn't do it, but unfortunately, you can't take back an action like that. It's just chilling that even just sitting in a movie theater, an act of violence like this can strike you. And obviously, rest in peace to Riley and Anthony.